Finally, there arises the monstrous symbol and vessel of the completely emancipated intellect, the world city, the center in which the course of a world history ends by winding itself up. A handful of gigantic places in each civilization disfranchises and disvalues the entire motherland of its own culture under the contemptuous name of the provinces. The provinces are now everything whatsoever, land, town, and city, except these two or three points. There are no longer noblesse and bourgeoisie, freemen and slaves, Hellenes and barbarians, believers and unbelievers, but only cosmopolitans and provincials. All other contrasts pale before this one, which dominates all events, all habits of life, all views of the world. The stone colossus Cosmopolis stands at the end of the life's course of every great culture. The culture man whom the land has spiritually formed is seized and possessed by his own creation, the city, and is made into its creature, its executive organ, and finally its victim. This stony mass is the absolute city. Its image, as it appears with all its grandiose beauty in the light world of the human eye, contains the whole noble death symbolism of the definitive thing become. The spirit-pervaded stone of Gothic buildings, after a millennium of style evolution, has become the soulless material of this demonic stone desert. These final cities are wholly intellect. Their houses are no longer derivatives of the old peasant's house, whence the culture took its spring into history. They are mere premises which have been fashioned, not by blood but by requirements, not by feeling but by the spirit of commercial enterprise. So long as the hearth has a pious meaning as the actual and genuine center of a family, the old relation to the land is not wholly extinct. But when that too follows the rest into oblivion, and the mass of tenants and bed occupiers in the sea of houses leads a vagrant existence from shelter to shelter like the hunters and pastors of the pre-time, then the intellectual nomad is completely developed. Looking down from one of the old towers upon the sea of houses, we perceive in this petrification of a historic being the exact epoch that marks the end of organic growth and the beginning of an inorganic and therefore unrestrained process of massing without limit. And now, too, appears that artificial, mathematical, utterly land-alien product of a pure intellectual satisfaction in the appropriate, the city of the city architect. In all civilizations alike, these cities aim at the chessboard form, which is the symbol of soullessness. In the year 74, Rome, in spite of its immense population, had the ridiculously small perimeter of 12 miles. Consequently, these city bodies extended in general not in breadth, but more and more upward. The block tenements of Rome, such as the famous Insula Folliculi, rose with a street breadth of only 10 to 17 feet to heights that have never been seen in Western Europe and are seen in only a few cities in America. Near the capital, the roofs already reached to the level of the hill saddle, but always the splendid mass cities harbor lamentable poverty and degraded habits, and the attics and mansards, the cellars and back courts are breeding a new type of raw man. But no wretchedness, no compulsion, not even a clear vision of the madness of this development, avails to neutralize the attractive force of these demonic creations. The wheel of destiny rolls on to its end. The birth of the city entails its death. Beginning and end, a peasant cottage and a tenement block are related to one another as soul and intellect, as blood and stone. But time is no abstract phrase, but a name for the actuality of irreversibility. Here there is only forward, never back. Long, long ago the country bore the country town and nourished it with her best blood. Now the giant city sucks the country dry, insatiably and incessantly demanding and devouring fresh streams of men till it wearies and dies in the midst of an almost uninhabited waste of country. Once the full sinful beauty of this last marvel of all history has captured a victim, it never lets him go. Primitive folk can loose themselves from the soil and wander, but the intellectual nomad never. 
Homesickness for the great city is keener than any other nostalgia. Home is for him any one of these giant cities, but even the nearest village is alien territory. He would sooner die upon the pavement than go back to the land. Even disgust at this pretentiousness, weariness of the thousand-hued glitter, the tadium vitae that in the end overcomes many, does not set them free. They take the city with them into the mountains or on the sea. They have lost the country within themselves and will never regain it outside. What makes the man of the world cities incapable of living on any but this artificial footing is that the cosmic beat in his being is ever decreasing, while the tensions of his waking consciousness become more and more dangerous. Civilization is nothing but tension. Tension, when it has become intellectual, knows no form of recreation but that which is specific to the world city, namely, détente, relaxation, distraction. Genuine play, joie de vivre, pleasure, inebriation are products of the cosmic beat and as such no longer comprehensible in their essence. But the relief of hard, intensive brain work by its opposite, conscious and practiced fooling, of intellectual tension by the bodily tension of sport, of bodily tension by the sensual straining after pleasure and the spiritual straining after the excitements of betting and competitions, of the pure logic of the day's work by a consciously enjoyed mysticism, all this is common to the world cities of all the civilizations. Cinema, expressionism, theosophy, boxing contests, dances, poker and racing, one can find it all in Rome. And then, when being is sufficiently uprooted and waking being sufficiently strained, there suddenly emerges into the bright light of history a phenomenon that has long been preparing itself underground and now steps forward to make an end of the drama, the sterility of civilized man. This is not something that can be grasped as a plain matter of causality, as modern science naturally enough has tried to grasp it. It is to be understood as an essentially metaphysical turn towards death. The last man of the world city no longer wants to live. He may cling to life as an individual, but as a type, as an aggregate, no, for it is a characteristic of this collective existence that it eliminates the terror of death. That which strikes the true peasant with a deep and inexplicable fear, the notion that the family and the name may be extinguished, has now lost its meaning. The continuance of the blood relation in the visible world is no longer a duty of the blood, and the destiny of being the last of the line is no longer felt as a doom. Children do not happen, not because children have become impossible, but principally because intelligence at the peak of intensity can no longer find any reason for their existence. Let the reader try to merge himself in the soul of the peasant. He has sat on his bleed from primeval times, or has fastened his clutch in it, to adhere to it with his blood. He is rooted in it as the descendant of his forebears, and as the forebear of future descendants. His house, his property, means here, not the temporary connection of person and thing for a brief span of years, but an enduring and inward union of eternal land and eternal blood. It is only from this mystical conviction of settlement that the great epics of the cycle, procreation, birth, and death, derive that metaphysical element of wonder which condenses in the symbolism of custom and religion that all land-bound people possess. For the last men, all this is past and gone, that which the man of intelligence, most significantly and characteristically, labels as natural impulse or life force, he not only knows, but also values, causally, giving it the place amongst his other needs that his judgment assigns to it. When the ordinary thought of a highly cultivated people begins to regard having children as a question of pros and cons, the great turning point has come. For nature knows nothing of pro and con. Everywhere, wherever life is actual, reigns an inward organic logic. The abundant proliferation of primitive peoples is a natural phenomenon which is not even thought about, still less judged as to its utility or the reverse. When reasons have to be put forward at all in a question of life, life itself has become questionable. At that point begins prudent limitation of the number of births. And at that point, too, 
a man's choice of the woman who is to be, not mother of his children as amongst peasants and primitives, but his own companion for life, becomes a problem of mentalities. The primary woman, the peasant woman, is mother. The whole vocation towards which she has yearned from childhood is included in that one word. But now emerges the comrade, the heroine of a whole megalopolitan literature from northern drama to Parisian novel. Instead of children, she has soul conflicts. Marriage is a craft art for the achievement of mutual understanding. The father of many children is for the great city a subject for caricature.